So thank you all for joining our webinar today. Uh, we'll be looking at three ways to retain customer loyalty in a socially distant era. Um, it's likely that COVID-19 will have a lasting impact on how your company operates um, and how customers engage with you. Um, and with so many people social distancing, um, interacting with your customers with a responsible and informed strategy is paramount to ensuring their loyalty in both the short term and the long term. So in this webinar, our panelists will share how to develop data-driven decision making. So we're kind of looking at segmenting, targeting and engaging customers to understand and communicate to their needs. Uh, secondly, uh, aligning with the right channels and touch points to improve digital engagement with your customers. And thirdly, uh, effectively communicating with your customers and responding appropriately to political um, and economic escalations. So joining me today um, is Letizia, uh, and she's helping independent pharmacies across Europe to champion their businesses. Gareth uh, is the UK and European Marketing Director for Cobalt Music and AWOL. Uh, Cobalt Music Group is one of the largest, most innovative music companies in the world. So they represent around 60% of writers in the Billboard Top 200, so big deal. Um, Cobalt and its uh, unique alternative label uh, AWOL uh, work with some of the biggest artists and songwriters in the world so your childish can be you know Max Martin, Phineas and Little Sims. We also have Ira and she's the growth hacker for Launchpad which is BP's business builder so they're on a mission to help scale businesses that deliver cleaner, more affordable and more reliable energy to the world. So I'm going to begin the webinar today with a poll which I'm going to put into the webinar shortly um, and we're really asking them this question, have you retained the loyalty of the majority of your customers during the crisis? So that should be on your screen now, and I'd really love to see your answers to that poll question. So I'm now gonna ask each of our panelists to give an opening statement to the question, what three ways do you propose brands retain customer loyalty in a social distance era? So for context, um, they're just going to explain a little about who their customer is as well. So I'll start with you, Ira. Um, what three ways do you propose brands retain customer loyalty in a socially distant era? Sure, hello everyone. Um, as mentioned by Sam, I'm working for BP Launchpad. <laughs> Uh, which is a business builder. And currently I'm involved in working with one of the residents, which is Vive. And Vive, it's a mobile app that uh, helps users to track, reduce and understand their carbon footprint. So our target customers are, I would say 28 to 45 years old, uh, very techy uh, audience and uh, with average or higher than average income levels and um, that are conscious about the, uh, their impact on the environment. And in terms of uh, customer loyalty and how to keep this, what I believe from my experience, um, client like advertisers should do on their side is first uh, understand the problem of their customers. What are they, the customers facing right now during the COVID-19? What it is they, they are caring right now? Secondly, um, tailor your messaging to the to the audience. Uh, tailor your messaging and offering to the audience. And lastly, make all your uh, communication with the customers personalized. So um, it will it will be useful either to build user cohorts based on the behavior of your audience, either it's in the app on the website or in your offline store. Um, uh, for example, if you are Let's say how we do it at Vive, right? Currently, we did uh, focus groups a couple of um, couple of weeks ago. We did focus groups. We talked with the audience. We tried to understand what they would like to hear from from us and how we could build further our brand and uh, messaging with them. So, what we did we communicate to them further? Firstly, we um, we care about our people. And for this, we uh, have sent all our people uh, working from home with full salary included. So what we try to communicate that we stand to our brand mission and we would like the customers to understand this. And when we send this communication to the customers, either through social media or through direct email campaigns, we actually got a very positive respect from, from, the, from the users that they, they understand and they really support us in what we are doing. That's for me. 
forward. Um, and I'll put the same question now to Gareth. So um, what three ways do you suppose brands retain customer loyalty in a socially distant era? Uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, so as Sam said, I work at Cobalt Music Group and its label, AWOL. Um, so I suppose working in the music industry, our audience is everybody. So it makes it quite a wide, disparate group of people to advertise to. Um, but obviously, when we are looking at it from a particular band's point of view, we have very, very strict guidelines on where we, you know, who we want to approach. So for someone who is, say, uh, like a, a new pop star, a lot of the time it would be 14 to 21 year olds. But then, say, it could be someone like David Gray, where we're working with more 30 to 45 year olds. Um, and my role across that is quite odd because I'm, as well as being the marketing director for the company as a whole, I also work on specific album campaigns. So I have to advertise what we do as a brand and a business, but then I also have to advertise um, our artists. Um, and I think like the three things that I think are important you know, about retaining customer loyalty, um, one is completely to, to echo what Eris said, it, it starts with how you treat your own staff. Um, and I think a lot of people will look back over this period and will, you know, customers will actively leave people who have not treated their staff in the correct way. Um, and I think I like, a, there's actually a piece I think I've written for Sam coming out today with like a, a point that I put is that, um, you know, staff are your biggest advocates anyway, or your biggest detractors, you know, you have to treat them well. Um, but then going on to a couple of other points, I think for me, it's like, don't shift your trajectory. Like, um, actually, another thing I did with Sam a year ago when I talked about how when we look at a marketing campaign, we will know how we want to end it and we know how we want to start it. And we know that there's a bunch of points that will happen along the way there. Um, but we can't know everything that's going to happen within that period of time. And I think you you have to look at what's going on now as a bump in the road rather than something that is a fork and will take you a different direction. Because I think if you change the trajectory of your marketing, um, your customers won't really understand it and you know they won't feel loyal to you. They don't, don't feel you're the same company they, they were part of before. Um, and I think that goes down to, um, the other one is really just be honest with your customers and people who aren't yet your customers and yourselves as to who you are as a company. Um, I'm sure we'll come, we'll talk about what's happening in the world a lot over the next hour. But, you know, one of the key things that's coming out with Blackout Tuesday yesterday is, yeah, there are a lot of people putting black squares up, but what does their company actually do to support, um, you know, the, the black civil rights movement or to, to support black people in general or in their own teams? So, you know, you have to be honest, otherwise people won't be loyal to you at all. Yeah, one hundred percent. I'm I'm now going to ask the same question to Letizia as well. So, um, for your opening statement, what what three ways do you propose brands retain customer loyalty in a socially distant era? Yeah, thank you so much, Sam. And can we share the presentation? Maybe it would be easier for the panelists and even for myself to go through the three ways. Of course. Oh. <laughs> You are spoiling my presentation. <laughs> Don't worry, okay? So, okay, three ways. So, first of all, um, in my opinion, these are the three ways to be sure that your customer base will be loyal in this difficult time. So, first of all, create sense of care and connection. For this, I mean that we should aim uh, to gain the trust of our customer base. So if they trust you, you will learn your customer attention. So what we want is uh, the attention of our customer base. And for the consumer, trusting the brand they buy is becoming more and more important. So they really want to know where your product comes from, how you treat your employee, how you treat your community. So they want to be aware is a trend that I can see across Europe and then I would say across all around the world. So the second point is to be ready to meet new and old customers in a new way. So creative thinking, new tools, new customer experience can address 
customer acute needs today and for stronger ties in the post-COVID-19 era. So for example, listen to your customer in a quicker way, create an online voice of customer program and analyze customer feedback captured via your call center or customer care teams can be extremely, extremely useful. The third one, be prepared to reimagine your customer experience and building new capabilities so to adapt for a fast changing environment. Uh, and in my company, it's a huge company, but is I can see across all the companies all around the world, we are all working on a zero budget environment. So because the crisis, all the budgets are cut. So we need to think in a smarter way. So let's come back to the first point. So create sense of care and connection. What does that mean exactly? For me, it means that you should reach out your customer with support, no marketing. So don't try to sell immediately. Try to understand their needs, how it's going around. For example, in Boots here, UK, we develop a new way to communicate to our customers. So, for example, at the end of June will be the Father's Day and we send at the beginning of June an email just to be sure that our customer wants to receive communication related to the Father's Day uh, celebration. Or maybe they don't want because it can be a tough day for someone. So we want really to have some immediate feedback from our from our. Um, customers and don't and we don't want to push too much our products uh, another point very important for me is to make sure that your employee and your communities are priorities for you so in times of crisis caring for customers starts with thinking first about employee so make sure that your employee knows that you are caring about them and be Keep in mind that your employee are your first ambassador. So be 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 very careful about how you treat your your employee. And then I I already mentioned the fact that uh, company should gain the trust of the of the consumer. Online is available a nice uh, um, trust barometer barometer that can help. Uh, manager to understand how consumer trust about communities. I have shared a link and everybody can give a, a look to this kind of research that is available online, is done across eight countries. And this, the aim of this research is to understand if you are working to gain the trust of your, your community. And talking about sense of care and connection, Google Trends and thinking with Google are all uh, tools that you can use for free to understand how your consumer and in general the customer base is browsing on the internet, what happened in internet. Of course, we are all in, in our house 24 hours, so we are using internet in a different way. Maybe you need to adapt your CEO. And second point, be ready to meet customers in a new in a new way. What does that mean? It means that you, you shouldn't assume that your consumer will automatically migrate to your existing digital and remote platform. You should actively raise awareness in the internal capabilities and needed to support adoption of this experience. So for example, in Italy, e-commerce sales for customer product rose by 81% in a single week. And this creates a significant supply chain bottleneck. So you should be able to meet all these customers. So take advantage of this uh, slowdown in terms of uh, business to really assess and auditing your digital properties. And if uh, part of your customer journey is 
uh, in a physical channel, consider converting to the contactless operation. For example, in the United States, I've seen a 20% increase in preference for contactless operation, uh, with numerous industries adapting to the change. So, for example, Walgreen, another company in my group, has rolled out the drive through shopping experience. So, you can have the experience as a like a McDonald's drive, drive through um, shop and we adapt in a pharmacy. So it's a, it, always a, an, a, um, try to adapt your, your custom experience to a, a different world. And the third one, flexibility. flexibility. So as I said here, it's crucial to have a real pulse of what happened in the market and be able to adapt all your organization on something new. So we, we are becoming more agile, smaller team, test and learn and time to market shorter. So these are the free way for me to keep you the, your customer base loyal. Fantastic, thank you very much. So um, I just wanted to quickly address a question from Craig Swan in our public chat. Um, this uh, seminar is being recorded, so we'll be posting this on our content hub afterwards. Um, our content hub is something we now have on our website, and as Gareth mentioned in his opening statement too, um, we have content from the likes of Gareth um, coming onto the content hub um, every week, so please do get a chance to, to check it out. Um, I'm now going to move um, on from our opening statements and kind of have a more uh, general discussion over the next 45 minutes uh, with our panellists. So to Gareth, Ira and Letizia, feel free to comment in uh, and jump in when you see fit. Um, my first question I'm going to pose is, um, have you been changing the way you're engaging with customers in light of coronavirus? Um, and how should other brands change the way they engage with their customers in order to retain loyalty? Does anyone want to jump in first? I'll jump in. Is my mic working? Sorry, I keep saying it's not working. It's working. Cool. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, as in, how have our how have our have we changed? Um, obviously, with album releases, people didn't expect to have to have everything this digitally focused, um, and you know that album releases have a huge live component to them which uh, artists can't do right now um and so the way that has forced them to change is to really dig into their digital um kind of mindset um and i'll give an example of that is that we had a band called the hell and the hum uh who released nam last week who obviously would have had a european tour that happened with that um so to build up what would have been their customer base beforehand they created a album listening party for sort of a number of weeks before to build it up. What that meant is they obviously were bringing new people in, you know, to, to find the band, to discover the band, but also were kind of treating their existing customers, so to speak, to something that other people weren't getting. Um, and that meant by the time the album came out, they were increasing their uh, socials by sort of 10 to 20% every week. Mm -hmm. That's quite a high growth. Yeah, they're they're a new yeah. band as well, so I mean, I suppose it's all relative. <laughs> cool. Um, maybe I can share as well um, from the experience that we have at Vive. Uh, we are heavily dependent on people um, traveling. And not just traveling internationally, but also travel in country in even daily commute to and from work, because the app functionality is based on adding a trip or uh, allowing uh, live traction, uh, and then we would calculate your carbon footprint from this um, from this movement. So we had to tremendously change our communication with the new uh, with the new users for the new acquisition and we did it by uh, letting them know that by staying at home they could also calculate the carbon that they have saved already and we hope that 
currently it's not about your actual carbon footprint, but it's more about educating people in terms of how much they have saved and how much they were usually producing on a monthly or daily or weekly base. Uh, so we have changed, let's say, the overall app and marketing from um, simply um, tracking to more of educational part of it, how people could use it even from home. And we did a couple of campaigns on social media as well for this. Uh, being ourselves as a small startup, uh, using the app, uh, doing some live stories on Instagram, posting everything on LinkedIn, just trying to uh, engage people and just at least calculating their 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 footprint. Yep. And Letizia, at Boots, um, how have you changed the way you're engaging with customers in light of coronavirus? Yeah, I think that the biggest change for us was the speed that we we used to have before the coronavirus and now so now everything is much 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 quicker so even in terms of feedback from our consumer we used to run some kind of survey online and have also even three weeks to have some kind of feedback and stuff like that so now it's impossible to think that we have to wait three weeks before having an answer on what is going on on the market so uh, we are using um, social media to understand what happens. So social listening for us is extremely important. And I think for all the company now, it's very important because um, hour by hour can change. So basically, we are relying more on social media and we, we transform all our organization something much more agile because, of course, in, in order to answer to these new needs, we need to be effective and very quick in, uh, in delivering new kind of communication because more or less the tools are the same. What has changed is uh, the content and the speed to deliver this kind of content. That's a really good point about agility. And uh, Gareth, I remember reading an article you wrote on agile marketing, now more than important, more important than ever before, I guess. Um, have you noticed your agile marketing get even more agile? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I think the thing with agile marketing and with authenticity, which I'll talk about, authenticity, which I'll talk about a lot as well, they've become huge buzzwords as well, which is kind of problematic because people really don't know how they're doing them properly. Yeah. Um, but I think in terms of agility, 100%, like I, I actually just wrote down one of the thing to say was about um, was about partnerships. And I think obviously, as a, you know, we're, we're setting up partnerships all the time, we, we have to. Um, but three of the biggest partnerships we have started didn't exist until April. You know, we didn't even have a conversation with those people until coronavirus had already gone into full effect. Um, and I think, um, you know, we've had to change within those, even within those partnerships themselves, like starting them off was one thing, but then you're kind of at the, the mercy of both brands direction and what's happening with coronavirus. So you have to change everything to fit both brands all the time. Um, and I think, yeah, that was a long way of saying, I, I think now more than ever, you're correct. Like you have to be agile. You have to be speaking to your team all the time. If you've got a marketing team that's global, you have to be checking in regularly. And I know how difficult that is. Like my entire team's in LA. I get that's a, that's a problem, but, um, you don't know what's happening the next day. I mean, like, let's be honest with coronavirus, there's quite likely going to be a second wave, but we don't know when that second wave is actually going to appear. So you have to be prepared for that. But you also can't spend your entire time marketing expecting it. So you have to be ready to change every day, every hour sometimes. There could be something new you don't know, especially looking at the last two weeks. You know, you, no one, you couldn't have known that the, well, you could have probably known, but, with George, Ford's, uh, George Floyd's murder, you couldn't have known that was gonna happen and affect society in such a way. So you have to be able to react to that as a company in an honest way. 
I completely agree on this and just wanted to add a small uh, comment as well um, that we have started to work more on partnerships in general and I see there is a in general like there's more interest between small and medium enterprises and offices to collaborate and cross promote each other I see great uh, support either on social media or through cross promotion either it's on LinkedIn or direct campaigns that um, more um, more partners that were not willing to work with you before, they are now more open to support you and vice versa as well. And so, that's all. No, 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 just saying, like, I think now it's also the time to just um, reach out to those um, potential partners of yours and potential peers that you have never thought before that you would work them at all. Mm -hmm. Just, I wanted just to build on what Hira just said, that is, I totally agree, of course, also with Garth, that, uh, for example, big organizations now are looking for startup because they understand that they are much more flexible, so they can really buy the flexibility to answer to the market in a much easier way and a faster way because, you know, in a big organization, sometimes you have some kind of resistant um, environment and it's not super easy to deliver uh, a minimum viable product in a quick way. So I saw an increase in terms of partnership with startups. So the, I think there are lots of opportunities in this crisis for startup to partner with big organizations. And also just to follow both of those on is like, everything now is digital. There is, there's almost no direct or live activations going on. And digital is cheap. You know, so essentially like no idea is too stupid at the moment because everybody is kind of in the same boat. You know, everybody is doing webinars. <laughs> <laughs> Owner, but you know doing webinars or doing live streams or trying to put out social content that really hits with their audience if you can go to a bigger company or to a brand that you've tried and they've not really been interested for and say well we've got this really good idea we know we can pull it off and to be honest what's the loss for you you know even if we get it to the point that it doesn't necessarily go live you as a business have had the experience of working with a huge brand team and seeing how that works and how the cogs and mechanisms work within that but also, you might come out with a huge campaign. We did a campaign with Zoom two weeks ago, and that was one of the ones we hadn't even started speaking to them through four weeks ago. So, it, it, you know, that was a bit of a rant, but I feel like you can do, you know, it's a time to do anything at the moment. 100%. And actually, that's a, exactly. it's, it's a really good point um, in terms of actually how we're changing our messaging to customers. Um, so I guess, for, I guess the next question is, um, is retaining customer loyalty in this socially distant era that we're in about changing our messaging to our customers? I mean, how are we doing it? How are we communicating effectively and in a different way and responding appropriately to the kind of political and, and economic escalations going on um, all around us? And I think it's no more apt a time than now to, to talk about um, how you're changing the way you're you know, communicating with customers. Um, have you have you all seen your messaging changed? I can go first. Uh, yeah, yeah. I saw a dramatic change in terms of communication and content. And as, as I said, is one of the first way that we should keep in mind to retain our customers. So for me, it's essential to show that you care about your customer, your community and your employees. So uh, we saw a lot of company across Europe and across the world that change the production in order to deliver to the community a support. So Ferrari change, Dyson change, so they deliver something for the community. I think it can be interesting to for us to know if our panelists agree that this kind of changing uh, can really last in the memories of the consumer because it's clear that all the company wants to deliver something for the community, not only for the customers, because now it's essential 
to be part of a bigger project, not only sell a product, not only sell a, sell a service, but now we are all fighting against something bigger than us. And I think that uh, all the companies now are competing to do something for, for the co community. And maybe now is it interesting to understand if all this effort will last in the memory of our, of our consumer or are going to be forget after the COVID-19 will finish. We hope, every, everyone hope very soon. Uh, but it's clear that all the companies are trying to connect in a different way with customer base and communities and employees. And it's the, way, the only way I think that now we can really have a communication with our stakeholders. It's the perfect time to put a poll in, I think. Yes. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask uh, our wonderful audience um, about the way organisations deal with their customers, their employees and, and the broader community in a crisis. Um, and uh, uh, effectively, uh, is this crisis likely to live lasting memories on customers' minds? Are they going to remember exactly what we've done and how we've changed our messaging? So please do a... Uh, to. Do you reply to that to that question? Um, the poll is now open. I mean, Gareth, what do you think? Um, to to completely sit on the fence, yes and no. I think uh, you only have to look at the beaches in the US uh, to see that people forget about things very very quickly. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think I think I do think it's going to have. I actually had the same conversation, not that I talk about brands with my wife, but I had the same conversation with my wife about this. And I was saying like, you know, are people gonna actually remember this? Mm. And I think a lot of things will happen, but they won't necessarily be front of mind that they've been caused by coronavirus. Um, I think there'll be a lot of kind of subliminal things that will change in the way that consumers respond to things and the brand, in the way that brands react. Um, I mean, you think of how, weird it would be three months ago to be walking down the street and give everyone a two meter gap like you know to actively move around people whereas how long is that going to stay in the memory of people after all of this gone that they're going to keep doing that because that it's been ingrained in them to do it and i think that's the same with brands and the same with the way that people react to brands there will be things that stay there i think there will be a real need to maintain community and I think as brands, I mean, to, to reel that back a bit, I mean, brands should be, so. brands are socially distant from everyone anyway. If you're a global brand, you're not in, in the living room of the person you're selling to a lot of the time. So I think a lot of the things that are learned throughout this will stay, but I also think people will quickly forget why they've happened. Mm -hmm. And for you, Ira, um... Do you think the sure. way we're currently dealing with customers and their employees and our employees uh, and the community at whole is, is going to have a lasting memory um, in customers' customers' mind, and and as a result, I guess their loyalty. Well, I would say in general, uh, from my experience and from what I have seen recently, uh, consumers' loyalty is uh, driven by the product itself and how users are attached to your product and how likely they want to use it and share it with your friends. And on top of this, you have their knowledge in terms of uh, how the brand shares their values and beliefs into, into their life, right? Um, so we see more um, retail, like more retailers, more advertisers, more companies uh, building around their brand, building the communities and so on. And what I think right now, uh, brands should actually stick to what they have stated before. They, of course, they can tweak the, their values and messaging, but it should still be the same, uh, the same, let's say, baseline, the same basis for all of them. They could have a particular uh, com commitment to coronavirus and how they treat their employees and how they treat their customers, but the overall core of their brand should stay unchanged anyway. And, um, of course, lockdown and coronavirus will one day finish and although the life won't be uh, won't be back to normal as i i think as on my humble opinion it won't be back to normal as it is it was before and we will need to just keep it in mind yes we had this uh 
crisis, let's say before, and what we have learned from this, what uh, were the right communication back then to the customers. And I think all the companies will need to do the analysis, what worked, what didn't work, what they would like to continue doing, what they think uh, maybe need to be tweaked and developed further. Mm -hmm. And this is a question um, sometimes of product. I mean, if the consumer is to go into a shop and buy some soap, um, are they really that loyal to the brand? Are they really that loyal to the soap comparatively to say if a customer was um, it, uh, buying a monthly subscription to coffee, which they knew was ethical and sustainable? Um, is there a, re a real difference there in the product about why a customer is loyal or doesn't really care? Um, Gareth? Um, I think you... I, I totally agree, and I, I think that it is about the product. I think people have to buy into the product, but you can you can have two products that people love, and then it, it that's where marketing comes in. That is that's the story. Like that's you create that story, um, but also marketing has its place because you using your coffee example, you might have ethically sourced coffee, but if people didn't know it was ethically sourced, they wouldn't care because they wouldn't know. And that's what our job is, is to make sure they know and understand how it fits with their lives. And I think that, like what that's why marketing is so important to driving loyalty, but it has to sit with product, whatever that product be, whether that be music or whether it be coffee. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's a, that's a really good point. I mean, Ira, do you... Do you I mean, we talk a lot about authenticity and about loyalty. I mean, how are you how are you seeing this being driven into the new brands you're creating with the BP Launchpad? Is it something that you're weaving into all the marketing discussions? Um, I would answer yes to this question. So for 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 Vive. Uh, what I'm trying to find right now is how actually we are different on the market from other offerings in terms of the product. And we are trying to focus on the features that we are giving to our users in the app and also on the story behind this. Uh, in the app, you can find projects, for example, that we are working uh, together with. And we only work with UN uh, with projects that uh, support UN Sustainable Development Goals. And this is what actually drives us as a team to also support those products projects, because we believe it's not only about offsetting your carbon footprint, it's also about helping those local communities uh, somewhere in Mexico or in Brazil or in Indonesia in their in their daily life. So I yes, my, my, my answer to this question would be yes. It's always about finding those differentiators from you on the market. And also it could be within your audience. When you speak to your audience, they could give you some um, thoughts and feedback in terms of why are they with you, why they use your product. And, and uh, if we continue talking about this point and think broader rather than uh, let's say vive what i'm really uh, inclined towards right now is um, fitness fitness apps or fitness platforms right now i think they're doing an uh, incredible job in in getting new um, customers and making them loyal uh, what i see right now either it's on Instagram, for example, or in particular uh, mobile applications, a lot of fitness apps are giving either free classes, either free um, private lessons, either live class, etc. And I am as a um, target audience really driven to use them actually even after the lockdown, because I think they are doing a very helpful job for me right now, trying to um, by staying at home and doing more like of the activities. Um, another example could be LinkedIn for uh, they have given for free uh, all the LinkedIn learning uh, f um, facilities and a lot of companies doing this right now. And this is what are helping um, them, the companies to be authentic and genuine in terms of what they're doing and trying to do so to give back to the community. I'm, he I'm hearing the word um, authenticity quite a lot. I think um, each one of you have said it now. Um, I mean, how can we be authentic? Um, what is um, authenticity? And and is that the key to loyalty? Um, because, I mean, we hear a lot about ethical marketing, um, anti-woke washing. Um, it'd just be good to unpack that a little and, and try and figure out what authenticity is and what that means to you. I mean, Letizia? 
Uh, yeah, authenticity seems that is the key in, in right now to build a relationship. And I totally agree with my colleagues. It's uh, essential to be authentic online. In fact, the most successful influencers online are the most authentic and is uh, es essential. How to, to become authentic, how to be authentic online. I think the, the only way is to come back to you, the mission of your company and remember always why you are on the market and what kind of needs you are trying to solve thanks to your services or thanks to your products. And what I saw as a new trend uh, and coming from Asia, but actually is already here in Europe, even when you have some kind of streaming during the lockdown period, as uh, Gareth said, everybody's doing a, a, a webinar. So we are much more online. What is important is to engage with your community. So listen to your community. And what I saw and what we are seeing everybody is that they community the member of the community are engaging each other so even during some instagram um, streamings you see people that are chatting each other while the uh, influencer is speaking so i think the only way to be uh, to be authentic is try really to show the pro to show the strength and weaknesses without fear and try really to do your best to uh, to stick to your mission and to solve problem to your community. This is the only way, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm going to switch up um, our discussion now because we've been talking a lot about authenticity, um, where to reach the customer and what message to reach them with. But another kind of key question we're seeing a lot about is um, and we often hear about retaining customers is about drilling down to the data, so getting granular to, to really understand behavior and motivation behind purchasing decisions. So that is to use data to find out exactly what it is that the customer ultimately wants to, to do and, and where they shop. So can customer loyalty actually stem from just using data in the right way? Um, how critical is it that brands develop um, data-driven decision-making era? I think it's critical. Um, and um, I'm not sure how it's for Leticia and Garrett, but for me, as a mobile marketer, it's it's the, it's quite easy for us because we do, especially we don't do any offline campaigns right now. So it's a mobile app and we have everything uh, implemented in terms of tracking. We use a couple of third-party platforms. so we can definitely say where are what are the marketing channels that the users are coming from and based uh, on their marketing channels we can see they behave in the app either it's uh, registration rate retention conversion rate, and etc so what are we doing right now from our side is looking into the conversion rate or points on the user journey and trying to find where is the drop uh, on the data and then start to work out on the product side or on the marketing side what could be A-B tested or improved on this particular state of the uh, user behavior. So I would say yes, data is important, but uh, everything needs to be implemented on your side if you want to rely on your data and you need to double check always that everything is tracked correctly. And for Gareth, how important do you find data is to your marketing? Um, I mean, it, it's incredibly important because, um, you know, so much of music consumption now is through streaming. So, like Eric says, the data is always there. Um, I mean, the, the key thing is making sure that you're not just making the data fit your own arguments, which I think is always an issue with data. Um, but I think, uh, you know, one of the ways that we can see it is we can see if um, fans are coming back again and again to single releases to an artist, but then if the next single doesn't track with those fans, obviously that that piece of music has not really hit them and they're not really feeling. And so it gives the band the ability to say, well, you know, we made this song, but actually it's not really hitting with our fan base in a way that you could only really see before through live. You know, you, if you played a song live and your fans booed you, you'd know that's a pretty, it's not the song that they really enjoyed. But now you can see it through streaming data and you can see, you know, through download consumption and things like that. So it's hugely important. I think it's just, like I say, making sure that you're not just using data for the sake of it to fit your own arguments and also realizing where your data skews. Um, I mean, when the, the four of us are talking today and I said, you know, 
using streaming data as an example, it used to be that there would always be peaks and troughs during the week and there would be peaks throughout the weekdays and then troughs at the weekend because um, people were commuting and, you know, and, and, and then at the weekend they were out. Whereas now it's basically a flat line because people are at home all the time. Now that in itself is a data point that you have to recognize, but it also doesn't mean anything in three months time when it goes back to normal again. So you just have to recognize when data is important and how to implement it at the right time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to put a poll um, to the audience now because um, I'm really interested to find out how you've been using data. So, I mean, since the lockdown, ha have you made any kind of positive progress with your data-driven decision-making? So I'm going to put that in uh, now and it's in the open polls. So I'd love to hear... Um, how much progress you've made with data. Um, and then I guess my next question for the panelists is, okay, we've figured yeah, I want to add something to this. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> yeah, just I wanted to add, of course, yeah. I totally agree with my colleagues. Just I want to add that uh, apart from quantitative data, I think nowadays are very important qualitative data so try to speak to your consumer even to speak to your employee that they maybe they have a, a direct contact with your uh, con, uh, consumer so add to all the analytics that are available online also some qualitative analysis because i think that especially now that is so fast mm, i have the feeling maybe it's just my feeling but not all the trends are captured by by data and so even talk to people can really add some kind of value to, to, your, to your data. So qualitative and quantitative data are always useful to take some effective decision. Sorry for that. It's fine. I agree on this. Just a small comment. I also think sometimes you don't even need to do the analysis. You can find this uh, data online. Could be Google reviews. It could be trust pilot yeah. reviews. It could be uh, Apple Store reviews. Uh, and and later you could do like a survey with your uh, customers, or you could do focus group. So there is some, let's say, free uh, sources are already available for for the companies. Absolutely. Even comments on your Facebook page are yeah. an excellent way to understand how it's going on uh, out there. Yeah. That's that's the social listening points you were talking about earlier, right? I mean, how important is social listening to, to you guys for um, as, as sorry, as a source of data? I think it's it's similar to what just Leticia said. We are trying to uh, track all of the sources where our users could leave us a review or give us a feedback, either through the website, through Apple uh, App Store, or Google Play, um, or either on any of the review websites. We are just trying to get this feedback and iterate it on our side and somehow implement it in our roadmap if there is need. Mm -hmm. And definitely in terms of social media, we are, we are trying to answer all of the queries, all the comments uh, of, the, of the followers. And um, I mean, on that point, um, what is a good source of data? Um, where is most of your data coming from? Um, Gareth, is it from streaming? So um, no, no worries. Is, right, where, right. where is most of your data coming from? Is it uh, coming from streaming? Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for on the music side, it will be coming from the various different DSPs, so Apple Music, Deezer, Spotify, um, and then the downloads uh, that come off the back of that. But then obviously we have um, like chart information, playlisting information, um, you know, and that it's that's incredibly important I, i'll give you another example of an artist of ours a guy called bruno major um now off the data that he got from uh, our own analytics tool he was able to plot out his entire asia tour because he could see every city and the listing consumption habits of that city for his music but then you can go deeper than that because you can then say okay well in this particular city I know that my music is more popular with 16 to 24 year old women than it is with men. So that means I know how to do my Facebook targeting and, you know, you can really dig in that way. And then I think going back to Letitia's point about um, 
qualitative data, that's equally important because at the end, a lot of the time you have to report back, you can report back what's happened through data, but you need to report back why as well. And I think the qualitative element of that really kind of brings the whole picture together. So on the, on the point of data, I mean, what should we be using data for and what exactly is it that we should not be using data for? We talk a lot about um, the difference between quantitative and qualitative data. I mean, what are you seeing, Ira, um, in terms of kind of what you should be using data points for and maybe what isn't so important for data? Well, <laughs> I would actually say use data for everything, to be honest. If you have enough data to make a significant uh, impact, uh, like if there is significant really difference that you are 100% sure this is the correct data and uh, it represents all your customer base, I would say rely on it and make your decision based on this in terms of your marketing spend, marketing activities and channels, and in terms of your product uh, roadmap and changing on the product. Uh, the question here is to get this data into your uh, into your hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because uh, let's say when you're a startup like us, it's it's difficult in the beginning to get quantitative data. If you're a startup, you start with the qualitative data. It's a feedback, it's a phone interviews, video interviews. And then when you build up a user base, you start to do A-B testing. And then you have enough uh, of, the, of the users that could actually tell you, okay, what's the right decision to make here? Of course, as a as a product or as a marketer, you have your assumption and your hypothesis that you need to uh, start working with, but then it's better to always move to, to data. Mm -hmm. And I guess back on the point, um, which is, you know, retaining customer loyalty at the moment in, in a socially distant era, and um, we've got a brilliant question which has come in on, on our Q&A um, from Claire Miller, which is how are you measuring your brand trust? I mean, um, would anyone like to take that question? Uh, I mean, I can say it's a weird one for us because we're measuring trust in artists, which is uh, an odd concept, I guess. Um, you know, you have to, you have to, social listening has to play a huge part in that. I think, you know, you have to you have to listen to the comments that people are giving you. But um, I think because everything's so digital now, sending out like little surveys, they don't actually have to be surveys, but like small questions to people. Like you've done polls in this webinar. Mm -hmm. If you're an artist or, or a brand or anything, you can send out polls to your listener base and get a really good understanding of whether they trust you just from small things like that. Mm -hmm. And what about for you, Letizia? Yeah, I was thinking that it's quite hard nowadays because, of course, the first thing that comes in my mind is uh, to become a trust. Uh, a trust uh, brand we should always use reliable source of, in, you know, of information and we should become really the first uh, top of mind brand in terms of uh, reliable uh, information because I think that the classical way to measure the trust in a brand like a net promoter score or customer satisfaction index are really uh, too slow in our days. Really, everything can change so quickly because I use several times in my experience in different companies, not only in WBA where I, I'm, I'm now, but even in other startups where I work. Net Promoter Score, Customer Satisfaction Index, so it takes uh, two months to have an answer, and so you can uh, organize your brand campaign a different way, but now it's start to be really, really... Uh, difficult because it's too long to measure. So what I'm personally doing is try to really understand from the best in class company what they are doing and try to have some kind of um, inspiration from them. I share before and I can do again a link for a um, trust uh, barometer I can share mm. with the panelists there they can find some ideas how the best in class company 
such as Nike or other one are doing in terms of uh, trust, how to gain the trust of their of their uh, uh, customers. So these are just examples. It's not super recent, this kind of report, but at least as a starting point. It's not so easy. Of course, the classical way are the common way, but it's so fast now and it's quite hard. So it's quite challenging, yeah. And Letizia, we've actually just had a question come in from um, Kim. And her question to you is, uh, to encourage bounce back, are you offering additional offers to loyalty members? Uh, as I said, for me, it's quite important, in this, especially in this period, to find the balance in terms of uh, care and connection with your uh, customer base and uh, the commercial uh, stuff for your business so i agree with my senior managers that now in this moment in this particular moment the majority of the communication should be focused on caring about your community the time in uh, delivering offer is later maybe in few weeks i think that now is essential for everyone to define what we should do now what we should do short term and what we should do long term so i think that everybody now should keep in mind what what you have to do now immediately what is in short term and then long term immediately we decide to focus on care and connection with community we are going to deliver some kind of promotion very soon so short term to re-engage customer they are interested in beauty because you know you are at home but in any case you maybe want to buy a lipstick or stuff like that just to feel a little bit better and long term how we need to reorganize our our company to respond to this new way to engage with the customer base. So it's essential for me to have three terms in, in your mind and deliver three different strategies. Brilliant, thank you. And we've got another question from Mohammed here, and he's asked, uh, what kind of marketing are you relying on more? So paid or organic, uh, search social, um, and has there been a change in your marketing strategy due to COVID-19? Um, Ira, would you like to answer that first? Sure, I can start. Um, I would say that we rely on both paid and organic. Uh, as currently we see an increase in terms of people uh, in general uh, using their mobile phones and, uh, um, and laptops to spend more time uh, online. So we need to catch this time uh, from them. And in terms of search and social, I would also say that we uh, look more into the search as this is the heavily intent driven, uh, heavily intent driven uh, channel for marketing. And usually uh, users are know what they are searching for. What I would say uh, from what I'm experienced now in the industry, uh, we are not the only one who have switched into the digital marketing. And I see an increase in CPMs on Facebook or on Google that now is the time for the advertisers to actually find something else rather than just Facebook advertising or PPC advertising. Either it's partnership that we discussed before or something else. And especially organic, uh, um, would be valuable for the advertisers right now if you would if you could work on your virality for example if you could spread the world about your um, website or about your app this is the way to go if you especially if you don't have huge marketing budgets like a, a lot of companies do and gareth for you what kind of channels are you relying on more to retain customer loyalty it's actually surprisingly similar um i mean i think like you can't discount like UGC, UG, like user generated content at the moment is gold because it gives you a direct kind of link to your customers. And I always say like, if you can get someone to, if you will put someone in the video for something, they are undoubtedly going to share it themselves. And then, you know, all of their family members will share it and it kind of creates this web for you. So UGC and social is huge for us at the moment. Um, paid, same sort of thing. Paid has got very expensive because everyone is doing paid marketing and there are limited options. Um, I think for us, uh, things like TikTok have obviously become huge um, and understanding how to use TikTok effectively, um, especially if you're a brand, like I think. Um, and so and kind of a, a point on from that is influencer marketing is very, very big. 
Um, but again, it's, it's now got to be like this weird mix of sort of authentic influencer marketing, which sounds two things that don't really come together very well, but they do. You know, you have to find, if it's a band, you have to find influencers who are into that band to make it an authentic sort of sell. Um, and then the other one really is we've done quite a substantial amount of PR um, because, you know, we, we have the links into, um, into the various different news formats and it's effectively free for us as long as we have a good story. So, brilliant, yeah. thank you. Um, we've got two minutes on the clock. So I'm gonna very quickly ask you all for um, your key way to retain customer loyalty in a socially distant era in just just uh, 20 or 30 seconds. Uh, so um, if you're ready, Gareth, What's your kind of key way to retain customer loyalty? Um, be authentic. Um, <laughs> but be honest about what your company is and speak to your customers as if you know them as people and they're not numbers, I think is the best way. And Ira? I would say make sure you have a product market fit and you know what your customers need. And when you know this, just uh, communicate to this point. And for you, Letizia? Yeah, listen, listen a lot. Listen your community, your employee, your stakeholder. Listen, 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 <laughs> and read numbers, of course. <laughs> a, a huge thank you to you all for joining me today. It's, it's been really appreciated. And I know we could go on for another hour, <laughs> um, but um, I know you've all got to get on with your day. So again, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm just going to finish off by putting in an offer uh, to everybody. Um, who's watching, um, you can now um, sign up for free to Customer Week, which we're running for e-commerce expo in collaboration with IMRG. It's got a real e-commerce digital focus. Um, so if you'd like to tune in and find out what's going on with customers right now, um, you can get your free ticket. Um, and again, please do check out our website. Um, this webinar will be uploaded to our content hub after uh, in the next coming week and there's loads of great content going on on there at the moment um, and as Gareth mentioned earlier an article uh, where he's commenting on purpose is going up today as well so a huge thank you for joining us and I hope uh, yeah you've learned three ways to retain customer loyalty in a socially distant era um, if not more so um, thanks again uh, and thank you all for joining I'll leave you to it have a great day bye thank you. Thank you so much bye ciao bye